Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the GRP office hours. Um, I will give it just a couple more seconds for people to log on. Um, so hopefully everybody is familiar with how things work by this point, but um, we will go ahead and take questions in the order of the raised hand. So if you'd like to ask a question, be sure to raise your hand using the raise hand icon at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, and then before we get started with um, answering questions, we're gonna go over a couple of items that are exciting, I think, and will um, hopefully make everybody really happy. Um, so we have gone ahead and made some updates to our NOFO. I think it actually should be um, the comprehensive NOFO in that top line, right? Um, Oops, yes. I'm moving too fast. That's right. The, the main title is correct. So we have done, um, we have released an update to our comprehensive cohort NOFO. And I think the main thing to point out in this most recent update is that we have reduced the eligibility threshold for the climate resilient and energy efficiency score. So it, it's really important that everybody please pay attention to this reduction in the threshold. We've reduced this, the threshold from um, 120 to 100 or a score of at least 75 on your NRI score or your um, energy efficiency score. So if you applied in the previous round of comprehensive and you received a letter that you were ineligible, but you think that your score is around 100, then all you have to do is just resubmit the same application you submitted for the previous round to this newest round. So there's still plenty of time to just resubmit that same application before the deadline tomorrow at 11.59 PM. So again, if you submitted your application already, uh, but received a letter that you were ineligible because you didn't meet the score threshold, we recommend that you just resubmit that same application to this, um, to this next wave, so, which is due tomorrow at 11.59 PM. There were a couple other updates that we made. So you can check all of those out on our website. Um, we have a summary of the updates that were made and you can also download the new NOFO, the updated NOFO. So that brings me to this slide. Thank you, Elena. Our next application wave is comprehensive and that's due tomorrow. And then we have the wave after that will be for elements, which is at the very start of the new year. So hopefully everybody is preparing their applications. And for all of those who are planning to apply tomorrow, please take note of the updated comprehensive NOFO changes. So with that, I will go ahead and start calling on folks. Um, Griffin? How's it going? Yeah, uh, I just had a question about well, I guess two questions. Um, so with the tomorrow deadline, is that just like like before midnight tomorrow? Yes, correct. I think it's 11.59 p.m. Okay. Um, and then you had said um, that you could just submit the exact same application if you were deemed like ineligible for the first round of comprehensive. But on uh, grants.gov this time, there's like a new form, the disclosure of lobbying activities. Is that that is like part of it now, or is that? I believe that should have been part of it the first time around too. Yep. Huh, I did not have to submit that one the first time around. Okay. Interesting. You should have had to submit that the first time around. So, um, and it, it shouldn't take any more, That it's a pretty easy form. So it shouldn't take any more time. You did, you did mention the deadline is at 11.59 PM, but we definitely recommend that you <laughs> You try and submit it at least a couple hours before then, because sometimes grants.gov will throw up a um, like an error message or something, and it might take a second to uh, to work around that error message. So 
I would recommend not waiting until 11.59 to submit, but um, that is the the final due, due date. Due time. And it's 11.59 Eastern time. So uh, yeah. please do the math and then give yourself a buffer if you're not in Eastern time. Okay, cool. Thank you guys. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I will also note for anybody, um, our team doesn't really have anything to do with grants.gov. Um, so if you do receive an error message, there is a whole separate grants.gov um, help desk and number that you can call. We have a, a FAQ on on about this on our website, so you can find the contact information for their help desk there. It's also on grants.gov, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have all the answers with grants.gov, so if you do have an issue with grants.gov, um, we really recommend that you reach out to that help desk team. Um, Mike? Yeah. Uh... So my question is with regards to the elements cohort, if we are applying for the elements cohort uh, and meet all the requirements for um, for applying, then we close on the property before the award is announced. Are we still eligible for still eligible to receive the award uh, if we were chosen? So you're saying at the time of application, you haven't closed, Correct. but then you close before the award is announced. Correct. Like mm -hmm. if we applied in a wave, did not get approved that way, rolled over to the next wave, closed onto the property and then got awarded in the next wave. <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. I believe that means that you would become ineligible. Yeah. You, you cannot close before the award. Okay. is made. Um, but that said, if you are trying to close quickly um, and you do receive an award, you can let us know that up front and we can try and make sure that we're meeting all of the deadlines that you have. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Anna? Hi. Um, I have two questions. One is an eligibility question. Um, so I'm working on a recently awarded 202 new construction project to build um, affordable apartments for seniors in Boston. And our proposal includes, um, you know, a passive house certification for the building, um, all electric energy systems. So I had heard that new construction projects could be eligible if it's a 202 award, but I wanted to confirm that. I don't know if somebody can. Yeah, so you don't currently have an assistance contract on the property. It's a new construction with a 202 capital advance. Correct. And PRAC um, support as well. Yes. So, Will, do you have any, it's eligible for elements. Do you have, do you have any sort of extended answer here? So, um, it's a, it's a not yet assisted property, right? There's no PRAC contract on it today, but you've got the capital advance award to develop it. So it's eligible for just for the elements cohort, not for leading edge or comprehensive. Okay. Um, uh, as, uh, and it's eligible between the time of when you have received the capital advance award up until up until before the, the initial closing of the capital advance. Um, and, and really the best time, the most convenient time for HUD, HUD underwriting consistency and all that is to, to try to get the elements award before you submit your, your application, uh, your, your firm commitment application to, um, to, to your, your um, capital advance underwriter um, so that it, the, the, the funds can be baked into that underwriting from, from the get-go. Okay, um, great. And then I guess I don't think elements had... Um these sort of pre-project benchmarking um, requirements for the application, did it? No. Okay. All right. Then I don't have that question. All right. Thank you so much for your help. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck. Thank you. Is it Mayfuka? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, I've, um, I have uh, uh, two questions. Um, I'm going to replace uh, the roof and but I don't know which one should I apply. Is element or comprehensive cohort? Um, so I think it's totally up to you on which one you apply for. I, 
if your property needs more expansive um, investments uh, beyond just the roof, then you might want to look at comprehensive because that's a more, um, I guess, comprehensive retrofit. If you are already going through a recapitalization transaction and haven't yet closed, that would make you eligible for elements. And that would be where you can select uh, a single investment with the GRP funding. But for elements, you have to be currently in a recapitalization transaction. Uh, okay, um, I try to understand the recapitalization transaction. Um, we, our, our building is old, 40 years old. Um, so we just need to replace the roof. Yes, and I'm actually, thanks Elena, just reminded me that roof replacement is actually not an eligible uh, investment in elements. So you would probably want to focus on comprehensive. Okay, yeah, that's why I want to ask about yeah. this one. And But the next wave of application it will be February 2024, right? The comprehensive. Yes. Yeah, so if you look on the slide now, so there's one, um, oh. there's oh. a due date tomorrow oh, okay. for comprehensive. Okay. And then there is the next one would be the end of February. Uh -huh. I'd say you would likely be able to meet the deadline tomorrow if you okay. already have benchmarking or have completed the multifamily building efficiency screening tool, then you may be able to meet that deadline tomorrow. But otherwise, you can definitely have plenty of time to get your application together for that February deadline. Okay, um, I, I don't know the two things you mentioned about it. I just I just start uh, to um, try to understand this, uh, this application. Um, but um, the problem is, um, what if um, uh, the contractors start, you know, we already approved by the them, um, by the HUD to, um, to replace the roof, do I have can can I just have the contractors uh, start replacing the roof uh, the roof before the no. uh, before the award? No. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, you would have to get the award first. We can't uh, reimburse any work that has already happened before the award. Oh, okay. Okay. So you could you could do it paying for it out of replacement reserves or something like that but or some yeah yeah some, can like, we you should, that, that, that that's between you and your account executive and 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 would be typically allowed uh but it would be unrelated to the green and resilient retrofit program right you'd be doing that and then you would be oh. coming into uh seeking funds under this program and potentially doing other and, and more extensive repairs uh, to make your property more energy efficient or climate resilient Okay. All right then. Um. Uh, so. Yeah. Okay. I will. I will just uh, probably using the. The reserve for, re replacement fund is more easier in that way, right? Um. If 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 that's um. So given that you say you've got a forty year old property. Yes. There might be other things that you need to fund besides the roof that are coming up. And so, for example, if you applied under comprehensive, what we would do is there would be a full capital needs assessment and environmental review, and, and we do other um, kind of assessments of the property to see if it's a good candidate for renewable oh. energy, something like that. And we'd create an entire scope of work with you for what the property needs to, to do, which could include the roof and you know 20 other things. Uh, oh, okay. Many of those other things, G GRRP funds could be used to pay for. Um, uh, uh, so, and it, it might make sense to be able to do all those things at once, right? If you need to, if you're replacing the roof and you need to move residents out for some period, um, it might make sense to be able to take care of other things at the property as well. Um, so I, I, I think that's the, the, that's the key question. If your goal is just to do the roof, then- uh -huh. yeah. I think you're just probably just looking at using replacement reserves to fund that and 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 moving on. But if you're uh, imagining that the property could need more extensive repairs um, and are looking for HUD sources to fund those repairs, um, then then uh, probably you know applying a comprehensive makes makes more sense. Okay. 
Okay. Um, because I don't know what else we are going to replace. So, <laughs> um, so we can we can ask uh, ask somebody to come in to look at what we need to be uh what we, what what we need to do to replace the the old building. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. Um, you, you know, for your own purposes of kind of overseeing the property you might have your own capital needs assessment to understand the overall needs of the property and how old all the different systems are. Okay. Um, you could also apply for comprehensive and we do the capital, we, are, we, we pay for the capital needs assessment as part of participating in the program. But I think I'd suggest only do that if your intention is to say, well, if I find that the property needs more things, I'm gonna go forward with figuring out how to pay for that using, of course, a lot of GRRP funds, but potentially you might need to supplement with some other funding, maybe replacement reserves, maybe uh, refinancing. Um, uh, uh, so uh, those are kind of two tracks, right? You could you could apply for GRRP and we'll do the capital needs assessment um, with you, um, or, or you kind of get a capital needs assessment on your own to understand the building more, more holistically see, well, what else is there besides the roof that are some big pending expenses that are coming up? Okay. So the I recommend you um, take a look at the video that Elena posted in the chat. Um, so if you go click on that link, that's going to give you a full overview of the comprehensive cohort. Um, so I'll, I'm going to ask that you do that and yeah, I already take some other questions. And then if you have additional questions, we'll take you We'll take you back again. I just want to make sure we get to everyone. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ian? Yeah, hi. Um, I had some questions about um, the the budgets for each of the cohorts. Um, it's sort of a little confusing the way it's worded in the NOFOs about how much money is is set aside in within each cohort. Um, so I was wondering if I could get some clarity on that. And then also if there's any way that um, either you could share with me or if there's a place where I can go to, to, to find out how much money has been awarded already um, through each of the cohort awards and, and you know, from there deduce what, what the budgets are that are remaining. Yeah, well, we've only made two award announcements so far. Um, so... I think that, um, I don't know if I have that information in front of me. We are planning on releasing that information on our website. We're doing a kind of website redesign now. So that should be coming online soon. I can grab the two press releases we've submitted so far, or we've, okay. we've publicized so far and drop those in the chat. Great. Is Is your concern that there's not enough money for you to apply or? No, not not necessarily that. It's it's that um well, first of all, the the just the the way that the the money uh like the budgets for each cohort in the no hope in the nofos, it's it's a little hard to understand like what the actual budget amount is for each cohort. Um, but I was on a a a, a webinar recently from ICF where they were sort of presenting about the awards that have been given out so far and um the numbers that they share didn't necessarily like add up to what is in the NOFO amounts. Um, so yeah, it's just trying to get a sense of like how much money has been awarded al already through the cohorts and and what what amount of money is left. Okay. Uh, oh, go ahead, Will. Just say generally, I understand the confusion. Um, the difference has to do with um, how much, or how many awards we end up making in grants versus loans, which have a different federal cost to us. I think the key thing for uh, your purposes is um, the amounts, uh, all of the amounts we projected in, you know, for different rounds in the NOFO uh, are still there. It's not that we've overspent or, or anything like that. Um, so any any funds we reserve for later rounds are still available. Um, the um and the difference between what we've shown in the nofo and what might show up in the press releases for the total amount of awards made has to do with uh, the grants versus loans so 
uh, we estimate uh, how much how may, how much will award in any round, but the true limiter is how much federal subsidy we have, um, uh, and so it doesn't um, uh, it doesn't align perfectly the amount that we announce in our press release versus the amounts that um, we, we announce in the NOFO um, a, a, as a result. Uh, I'm, there's I'm, also okay. um, there's money allocated for each of the four review periods. So regardless of how much we awarded in the first round of each, which you can add up in the press releases I just linked, there is still um, millions of dollars left for each of rounds two, three, and four for each of the cohorts. And those are lifted, listed as they're called like the second application review period, the third application review period, and the fourth application review period listed in the NOFO. Um, so there's plenty of money left over in each of the rounds or each of the cohorts. Okay, got it. Um, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a complicated answer to your question because, like Will said, the the cost of make the cost to us to make the award in the form of a loan and a grant is quite different. Right. So, um, right. But I think rest assured, we have plenty of money left. So if that's something you were worried about, that's not a worry. Okay, great. Um, I also had another quick question about the comprehensive and the multifamily assessment contractors. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that list of max that you've selected public yet? It is. It's on, oh, I think it's on our website. I think it's on our website. Um, Might not have gotten posted yet, but we're we're, we're working, working on it. it. We're, we're but thank you. <laughs> we're, we're we're working on posting it. Um, I believe we could probably post it in the chat, but we have um, we have contact information for each of the multifamily assessment contractor entities, so you could reach out to them directly. And you would also want to copy our um, HUD's um, procurement contractor or procurement officer. Okay, and is there any additional information about the way that Max are going to be subcontracting for the assessment work? Uh, not from HUD. You'd have to kind of reach out to them directly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Bryce. Hi there. Um, I submitted a leading edge application. Uh, you know, earlier this month uh, before the deadline there. And we're just kind of wondering, is there any sort of kind of general timeline on feedback or, you know, what we can expect um, as far as any sort of dialogue as the application is reviewed? So you'll get the first kind of wave of outreach as if we have any um, curable deficiencies with your application. So if we see anything that we need to clarify with you or that's um, missing, you would get that would be the first kind of outreach you'll get. Um, and then we aim to make awards within 90 days of each award deadline. Um, and if there's not any, you know, curable deficiencies, is it kind of just <laughs> wait and uh, see? Yeah, yeah. So if you don't hear anything from us, um, then we're working through it. Um, and then the award announcements and ineligibility letters would come out around that, you know, 90 okay. days-ish after each wave closed. Okay. All right. So, and I guess, is that process started in the, as far as deficiencies review? I'm, you know, is that kind of moving? We are moving through the application review process. Yeah. I can't quite say where we are though. Okay. All right. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Brady. Hi. Hi. Um, so I have two questions. The first one was around uh, the idea of an existing PBRA property getting rehabbed along with a new construction, which is not going to have Section 8 PBRA. So in that case, even though it's a combined transaction, will the Davis-Bacon get triggered only on my uh, uh, eligible property? Because that's the only one that I will apply for the award, but I will be conducting this transaction along with my new construction. So how will this affect the overall transaction? Is your your question is related to does Davis Bacon apply to the whole project? Yes, because I will get yeah I'll be eligible to get the award only on the existing KBRA property, which is part of the pro of the entire transaction. Yeah. Yes, I believe that if you're going to be using GRP funding, it is going to then uh, make Davis Bacon apply to the entire project. 
Okay, even though I will get the award only for my eligible units or the eligible building. Say that again. Um, so, for example, I have an existing building which has 87 units. And as mm -hmm. part of the have, I am also constructing. So I'm applying for GRRP for these 87 units. But I'm also constructing a new building which will not be eligible for GRRP awards. So it's going to be one single owner, one single entity doing this entire project. So mm -hmm. will the Davis Bacon get triggered on and on my those 29 units, which is not eligible for GRRP funds? I see. Yeah, the um, if it's all one single transaction and scope of work, which yep. it sounds like that's how you're currently construing it, then Davis Bacon would apply. If you're able to separate it out into two uh, phases or tranches with... Uh, okay. um, uh, uh, or kind of a, a mezzanine structure where they're they're technically two different owners, but all controlled by the same um, uh, uh, s single entity. Then Davis Bacon would only apply to the rehab of the existing project where the GRRP funds are used. One thing to note, though, your award, if it is one property. Um, your award is scaled based on the total units in the property. So you would get up to $80,000 per unit on the existing plus mm -hmm. the new construction unit count, as long as you are eligible, which requires at least a more than 50% of the total number to be assisted. So if I think you said 87 PVRA okay. and 27 new, that passes the 50% requirement. So if it's one property, you'd get funded based on the, I can't do the math on in the fly, but over a hundred unit count. Okay. So I can actually get the award even for my remaining 29 units. If it's one property. Okay. We base the award amount of how the property is, um, the property characteristics in IREMS. Mm-hmm. But these so, 29 units wouldn't be in IREMs yet because they're not yet built. Right. Um, so, Elena, Joey, how uh, would our would we currently fund based on these to-be-built units, e increase the award size based on these to-be-built units? Um, or do we need to look into this a little bit? More? I think maybe we need to dig into this a little bit further, given that they're not currently in IREMS. Um, if you could send like a description of this question to grp at hud.gov, I'm putting in the chat right now, we can get you an answer in writing about award sizing and Davis Bacon applicability. Okay, I will do that. But I think generally Davis Bacon is applied based off of the scope of work for a project. And so I think if you were to structure the project like Will was talking about and in, in kind of a phased approach, mm -hmm. then you can potentially apply Davis Bacon to a specific phase rather than the entire project if you're gonna kind of build the the new building in the second phase. Okay. But um, if you send us, yeah, if you send us the kind of the detail uh, in the inbox, we can get you a more um, coherent answer. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Um, Jordan? Hi, we're a, a residential services provider in New York, and we have several properties that are covered by HUD, uh, that, are, that are funded under HUD PRAC contracts. One of them, we have four properties, two of them have separate contracts with HUD, but then one of them, we have one contract that covers two properties. Uh, we're, we're looking at the comprehensive application. Would that be considered, the two properties aren't actually all that near each other. They're several blocks apart. Would that be considered one project or two uh, for, for this? We're, you know, it doesn't, it's not really a campus. They're not exactly near each other, but we do have like one agreement. Yeah, I think this goes, this is actually related to the question um, that we were just talking about. It's gotcha. the word is based off of how the property is, uh, input into our IREMS system. So if it is in IREMS as a single property, even though it's a scattered site property, then the award would be based off of the the kind of two sites that you have. Okay. 
So you should submit each one application for one IRAMS number. So if you have two application, two IRAMS numbers, you need to submit two separate applications and they'd be considered separately. If it's only one IRAMS number that covers both buildings, submit one application considering both buildings and they'd be, it'd be one property gotcha. in HUD's eyes. Gotcha. I appreciate that. And then we just, I, I had a quick follow-up question. We're new to this process and we're just kind of quickly trying to learn about it. When, we, when we're assessing our score, all of New York City kind of comes under the same FEMA risk score. Uh, you know, how does that affect, we, we want to, uh, it, it's like high, moderate to high risk. Is that is that good or bad in terms of how it affects your score? I, I wasn't sure how you guys are reading that. Well, remember that the score is actually, um, it's kind of multiple numbers that we right. combine to give you the score. So it's the within state NRI score with the national NRI score. And then it's the the efficiency score that's either based off of portfolio manager, the actual benchmarking of your property and portfolio manager or using our uh, MBEST tool. Okay. So um, it's kind of hard to, to say, but I think if you're, NRI score is 75 or above, then you automatically meet the threshold oh. according to our new, um, according to our new uh, uh, NOFO. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, I appreciate it. Yeah. Is it, is it Choi? Yes. Um, I was quite, I had a question about uh, eligibility. Um, this might not be applicable with the new guidelines, but um, I was told that projects that were acquired prior to 2021, or sorry, I think I might have it first, first. Projects that are not acquired prior to 2021, so projects that are acquired after 2021, are not eligible for GRPP funding. And I think, actually, I'm reading this now. Uh, is that true? But what if there was an, like an active HP contract that was existing that the part of the acquisition kind of are you saying like got, gone yeah. through a rad conversion or what do you mean by acquired? Um, there was an existing, it was part of a portfolio of existing affordable housing buildings. Uh, there was like a portfolio from private developer and the private developer had existing HEP contracts and they transferred over as part of the acquisition. But we uh, technically acquired them in 2022. Okay. And the HAP contract is, the property still has a HAP contract at, HAP, yeah. HAP contract that's active? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't see why you wouldn't be eligible. Got it. Cool. Yeah. And yes, that, the 2021 date is only relevant for a specific kind of HAP contract uh, that had been converted through the Rental Assistance Administration. But for any any HAP contract um, that, as long as it exists today, um, uh, it would would for any other kind of contract, as long as it exists today, it's it's eligible. Uh, and okay, cool. And as part of the, sorry, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask a follow-up question. That's okay. Go for it, and then we'll go okay. with Matt, and then we'll end it for today. Perfect. Um, part of the rehab work that we're doing, uh, the reason why we're thinking about the GRPP funding is because there is we we basically acquired properties that were not in great condition. And so a lot of the rehab work that we're doing is not only to bring into like the sustainability standards, but also like general fixing. So the scope of work is beyond the sustainability. I heard mm -hmm. the Davis Beacon trigger. I'm hearing though that the Davis Beacon will apply for all the work, not just the sustainability funding. Got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Very helpful. Yeah. Appreciate it. And remember that GRRP doesn't, uh, if you're doing the comprehensive cohort, GRRP won't typically pay for the non-green or resilient components of the scope of work. Um, so GRP will yes. pay for the kind of the difference between the standard investment and the, the green alternative. And then there's a kind of a, a range of uh, high impact items where GR, GRP pays the full cost. So that's just something to think about as well. Yes, no, totally. It was just the scope of work is generally bigger than just the sustainability yep. components, but we want to do sustainable components, obviously, too, since we like to make the building a little bit greener than it is. But this is really helpful. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Matt? Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, so I have a couple quick questions, I guess. Um, I'm pretty new to this process, so apologies if some of these have been asked before. Um, 
First question is just general eligibility. Is is this program able to be used for projects that are undergoing refinancing right now, or is this more of a mid-cycle uh, incentive program? Um, so our elements cohort is the cohort that is um, available to projects that are currently undergoing a rehab transaction, but have not yet closed. Okay. All right. So that is good news because that means I don't have the deadline tomorrow. <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> all right. That's great. Um, the other question that I had, so this is kind of piggybacking on, on the last one a bit. Um, we're, we're undergoing renovations for four of our buildings and we're going to be re refinancing them all. So they're all under the same ownership entity. Um, but basically what, what we're hoping to do is electrify the heating and hot water at these buildings. Um, this is all going to be part of larger building renovations, including facade repairs, windows, stuff like that. Um, we, we can segment it, right, and say that, you know, we're only looking to apply for this for heat pumps and air handlers, stuff like that that's related to electrification, or would we have to do, here's everything that we're applying for, and then leave it up to, I guess, HUD or, or GRRP specifically to determine, like, what applies and what doesn't? So if you're if you're applying to the elements cohort, um, you would want to take a look at the elements NOFO in the appendix. There's a list of eligible investments. Okay. And so you would choose from that list, and that would be the specific investments that you're paying for with the GRP funding. Okay. Okay, great. I think that covers everything. Then um, I'll, I'll definitely look more into into that. And you know, if I have any questions, I'll I'll join next week's office hours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Elena just posted the elements nofo in the chat. So perfect. Um, should have a direct link there. Um, Thank you all. I think we should close out today. Reedy, did you have a really quick question? Yes. Um, so if I'm applying for leading edge, and if I commit to one of the certification right now, but post award, if we realize that we cannot achieve that certification, we can change the selection certification. You can change the eligible certification with HUD approval, I believe, before closing. Okay, great. Thank you. But, um, remember to apply. You need the architect to sign off that the certification that you chose is feasible at your property. So you would want to make sure that if you had thoughts on changing the certification, that that certification you're changing to is also feasible at the property. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you everybody for staying on a little bit longer. Um, and if you have any additional questions before we meet next week, um, please send them to the inbox at grp at hud.gov. And um, yeah, we'll see you all next week.